Hi everyone, I'm Jessica. I'm with Literary Arts. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, if you're here for, is that a real poem or did you just make it up with Lisa Jarno? you are in the right place. Um, this is an event um, that is a part of the Bagley Wright Lecture Series. Uh, the Bagley Wright Lecture Series on Poetry supports contemporary poets as they explore in depth their own thinking on poetry and poetics and gave a series of lectures resulting from these investigations. Lectures are delivered publicly, publicly in partnership with institutions and organizations nationwide. And you can find out more about past, present, and future lectures and explore the archive at www.bagleywrightlectures.org. And I will put that in the chat. Uh, before we get started, I want to open up this space with the land acknowledgement. I know there's folks joining us from all over, but literary arts is based in Portland, Oregon, and we are currently on unceded land. The Monoma, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Walala Bands, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River occupied and operated on this land long before Western colonizers arrived, and many continue to do so today. Despite attempts of removal and erasure, these communities remain a strong and vital part of our future. Literary Arts recognizes that this acknowledgement is only a small step in affirming the ongoing presence and contributions of our Native communities, and we commit to engaging these communities more fully as we fulfill our mission. For those of you who are not familiar with Literary Arts, we are a nonprofit community-based arts organization with a 37-year history of serving readers and writers. Our mission is to engage readers, support writers, and to inspire the next generation with great literature. Our programs include Portland Arts and Lectures, programs for youth, the Oregon Book Awards and Fellowships Program, and the Portland Book Festival. We also offer reader seminars, writing classes, and free literary events like this one year round. And I invite you all to check us out over at literary-arts.org. And now it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Lisa Jarno. Lisa was born in Buffalo, New York, and educated at the State University of New York at Buffalo. She is the author of several collections of poetry, including Some Other Kind of Mission, Ring of Fire, Black Dog Songs, Night Scenes, Jo de, <laughs> de Beat, Selected Poems, and A Princess Magic Presto Spell. She's co-edited an anthology of New American Poets, and her biography of San Francisco poet Robert Duncan, The Ambassador from Venus, was published by the University of California Press in 2012. She has been a visiting professor at Naropa University, Brooklyn College, and the University of Colorado Boulder. She lives in Jackson Heights, Queens, and is a Master's of Divinity candidate at New York Theological Seminary, and is a minister at Safe Haven United Church of Christ. Thank you, Lisa, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, I'm actually, uh, uh, we can update it, a graduate of New York Theological Seminary now. So, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I have to say it's, uh, now that we're all here, I feel like, uh, I, I feel like I want to know more about you all and less about myself. <laughs> but but uh, as the business of the day is to for me to read this piece of writing that I have, that is what I will do. And then I hope we can all talk. That would be great. Um, <clears throat> so I see I see some friends here as well. So um, very very glad to be here. Uh, and I will pull up this talk. Uh, I think I'm gonna say also that uh, because um, this is a kind of intimate gathering, um, we could, uh, you could interrupt me uh, while I'm uh, <clears throat> uh, talking. You could um, put notes in the chat or questions if you want to. You could um, shout out uh, if you if you have an idea or 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 um, 
if you have a comment or question, uh, why not just like open it, open it up and see what happens. Could be great. It could not work, but we'll find out. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think that I can probably see, well, if I, I think I'll be able to see chat comments if they come up. Is that the case if I make my screen tiny? Yeah. All right. Or um, Jessica, do you want to flag me if you see a comment come up? Yeah, I can unmute and shout out if I see a question or comment. Yeah, yeah, do that. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm going to put you in charge of that. That would be great. Right. Thank you. Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the title of this lecture is, is that a real poem or did you just make it up? I wrote this talk on a train from New York City to Chicago. And I was feeling at least a little bit melancholy, maybe because of the autumn weather that felt seriously not autumnal, or maybe because of traveling away from things familiar in a time of such great social instability, or maybe because of the closure of this series of talks that have occupied my imagination for the last couple of years. This is the fifth and final lecture in this series that began in October of 2020 at the Poetry Project in New York City. That talk was called White Man, White Whales, and Whitehead. And it was a talk about my origins as a person in the little town in upstate New York called Derby, and about my origins as a poet in the neighboring city of Buffalo where I went to college. So this talk calls back to those origins and it delves into endings as well. This is also a place to explore my first book, Some Other Kind of Mission, which was written in the early 1990s and published in 1996 by Keith and Rosemary Waldrop at Burning Deck Press. And my most recent book, A Princess Magic Presto Spell, written over a period of the decade between 2009 and 2019 and published by my friend Devin Johnson of Flood Editions. I would happily say this latter book ends my life's work as a poet, not to be overly dramatic or grim, but to acknowledge the satisfaction I have with the work as an ending point. When I was on the train leaving New York City writing this talk, I was looking at the cattails in the marshlands of the Hudson Valley near Bear Mountain. And I was thinking about the idea of first things and final things, not particularly in relation to my own life, but in relation to the Holocene extinction event that is upon us, which feels to me like the universe's attempt to make up a new and different poem out of a troubled world. I have my own upstate New York origin story that contributes to the first things of my poems, gravel driveways, snowy owls, willow trees, morning doves, football, a bowling alley, jello and Campbell's soup. It's pretty down home stuff, pretty Americana. An old friend and mentor, the poet Jack Clark called it the Derby shuffle the way I and my poems make our way along through this lifespan. I knew what he meant then, as I said in the first talk in the series, it meant that I wasn't going to be a fancy academic poet, nor should I want to. And I understand the nuance of what he meant even more now, that over time, what I've done as a poet comes out of the guts of the origin story that at the matrix of the messy mix of snowy owls and Campbell's soup, I've developed an ear for the mystery that brings all those elements together into the creation. It's not a rarefied gift so much as it is what Spinoza talks about in twinning poetry and prophecy, that prophecy implies not a peculiarly perfect mind, but a peculiarly vivid imagination which usually is worth not much of anything in our culture. 
In the description for this talk, I mention a phrase from the book of Revelations. What does it mean for the poet to act as prophet in imagining a new heaven and a new earth? Both some other kind of mission and a princess magic presto spell hold keys to that question for me because they are books that began with the intention of imagining a new heaven and a new earth. The goals of those projects was not just to record events in the world or to create an imitation of life as Aristotle says in his poetics, but to see the undersides and oversides of this multiverse that we inhabit that might sound like something a fancy poet would say, but what I really mean is something simple. The going reality for me of the rocks and gravel and snowy owls and jello and Campbell's soup that occupies my origin story brought with it a feeling that there were mysteries outside of the seen world. The poem is not only something I make up, it is also something that makes itself revealed. It is a manifestation of life, a revelation of another order, a new heaven and a new earth, a breakthrough event where the divine streams in. Again, let's just stop here as what I said raises the red flag of a fancy metaphysical, Neoplatonic, Duncanian spiritual idea of what poetry is. But I would like to explore it also from a more practical angle, not from Robert Duncan's metaphysics, but from Wallace Stevens' more sober psychoanalytic reading. Stevens writes in his essays on poetics of the power of the poem, that it is a violence from within that protects us from a violence without. It is the imagination pressing back against reality. That tension is very real for me between the imagination and reality, or as I would also put it, between the sacred and the secular, or between the eternal and the temporal orders. Because I always experienced the day-to-day -day status quo of American life as an extreme violence, I was more than willing to jump into life as a poet and into a life where the imagination could press back against that reality as Stevens insisted. In the process, I also found that it's not just the violence of the imagination that protects us from an external violence. It's also the tenderness of the imagination that bears witness to the pathos of the real, of the profane, of the temporal. My first book, Some Other Kind of Mission, was built as a puzzle to tease out that tension between the sacred and the profane. And it was very much influenced by the poet Jack Spicer's idea of poetry as magic and the poet Robert Duncan's idea of poetry as revelation of a world. I was looking for an answer to a question or to several questions. On a personal, more mundane level, I was looking for an answer to a question about a doomed love affair. But on another level, I was looking for a confirmation that the combination of language and imagination could redeem me, could get me out of the pickle I was in, in my relationship to the real, both in my relation to my personal relationships and in relation to the violent landscape of my culture. I was looking to create a world that would buffer me, envelop me, reveal to me a higher order. I was then a fairly staunch atheist, but in retrospect, I can see now that what I was also, that I was also seeking divine intervention or revelation of the divine, which at the time, given my poetical interests, probably would have looked more like the intervention of a Greek God than a Christian God. When I went back to this book, Some Other Kind of Mission, I found a beautiful passage nestled in the final long poem that reminds me of what I was looking for and how I actually found it. Maybe it is Eros or maybe it is the Christ that I'm speaking of. I do know that partly this passage is a record of a dream that I had over 30 years ago. It was then that I realized I would be on a train 
in the hallway. It was at the end of the road, and that's how I knew I would always find it. It had water instead of a road. It was a river, but not the ocean. It had balconies, but a real house, a house that people live in. He thought I was poor and in his house. It had long lists written in red. He left me in his house, or that was my construction, but he had left me in his house. It was a crowded street with many houses, with the river plus balconies. The house became water. The road would enter a bigger road. At the edge of the road later was another house. I think of poetry as a process of building boats and building houses and making storehouses and treasuries. Staying busy building an eternal boat is exactly what I'm doing in the poem. The practical aspects of some other kind of mission, the compositional decisions emerged out of an antsiness I had about poems in that moment. I had taken a liking to Jack Spicer's proposition that the poem was a conjuring device. It frustratingly approached the real but the divine in language, the logos, was nearly impossible to pin down in our sad human logos language and imaginations. I had started to make Super 8 films to see if I could capture that logos in moving images. I had begun to record soundscapes around me. I was on a road trip with friends to North Carolina one Christmas when the narrative of the main prose components of the book came into shape while I was looking out the window of a little Honda Accord at the red clay embankments of the South. This is uh, the opening sequence from, from that book from some other kind of mission. Blood in my eyes, followed by truck in motel, either severely or proper, followed by police activity, followed by truck in, followed by, followed by, followed by truck and motel, at the library, at the truck and motel, at the of, today there, where they're taking me, followed by. I dreamt about and followed by a truck and thence motel, followed by properly, car construction, cup against in the Heron squared, in some other cities, in the dream, in the car, in the truck of, up against the car, against construction, against the truck, followed by metacules of fallout, up against the car, the truck, when I turned my head, as for my partner, followed by truck and motel. I knew it was turning my head in construction of carp up against the carp construction, up against the car constructed metacules of famous carp. It was a conjuring. It was the beginning of the creation of a world that included some of the elements of my origin story, the rocks and the gravel now accompanied by the trucks and motels and heron and carp. The prose sections of the book were collaged against visual poems that were in some ways transcripts of Super 8 films and sound recordings. The book opens with a homage to Homer, to Eros, and to the violence of the real with a collage listing the names of World War II airplanes. Messerschmitts, B-17s, Spitfires, and Zeros. That opening sequence includes the lines, give Helen back or some other kind of mission. Throughout the long intermingled road trip prose section, there's a turning back to the language of creation of the mix of rocks and gravel that make a solid road, all haunted by the decay of America and the silent watching trees. I think the power of the poem for me is in its ability to exercise authority over what I call in one prose section of this book, the target in the marketplace next to near the temple of the void. When I brought parts of this book in progress to a classroom of fellow students in about 1993 at Brown University, one of them said in exasperation, it reads like the plans of the quiet guy next door who builds bombs. And I thought that's exactly what I want it to do. I want it to blow up the cultural complacency. I want it to target the marketplace, the satanic commodity culture and to expose the temple of the void that we worship in the form of global capitalism. 
I don't think I would have been able to articulate this when I was 24 and writing this book, but I had a passion and I had an intuition and I was led along by the prophetic around me in a tradition that included the work Allen Ginsberg did in Howell to blow up Moloch to take on that giant. The title of this talk comes from a story I remember the poet Bob Creeley telling about an audience member at a reading asking him, is that a real poem or did you just make it up? After all these years, my memory fails me and I'm not sure if it was him who was asked this question or if he was relating the story of another poet being asked this question. All I know is that it happened to a poet at a poetry reading. And I love the question because the obvious answer is yes, I just made it up because I had a feeling about the potentiality of a new heaven and a new earth and I want to inhabit it. I had a feeling there was something beyond the actual Walmart on the highway. The easy way to describe it is to call it the eternal, the thing that we know is there outside of us. Though Jack Spicer says there are many ways we can describe that something beyond. He suggests we could call it the Martians or the id as well. But he was a good Calvinist for better or for worse. So I suspect he knew it could also be a thing called God. <clears throat> In my current spiritual tradition, it is called God or creation, a mystery that we get a glimpse of here and there that shines through events and language. My latest book, A Princess Magic Presto Spell, in its very title gives an indication that this Spicerian drama has never left my craft work, my boat building endeavors. What I wanted to write was James Schuyler's A Few Days or Bernadette Mayer's Midwinter Day. And of course, Anne Waldman's Eovis comes to mind as does the Cantos. And the question of what the cantos would look like if it were written by a woman and particularly by a mom. So at the beginning of this project, the cantos was always at the back of my mind and unconsciously elements of the Homeric epic came into the book as well, just as they had with some other kind of mission. But beyond these vague desires, there was no roadmap for a princess magic presto spell. I decided that when I could on any given day, I would write down a phrase of exactly three words. And I began that practice while largely socially isolated, caring for a few week old baby, my daughter Beatrice, who was a world to herself, who in my mind had arrived as a beacon from another world. And it may be that I thought it would be useful to record for her something of that time that we had together right at the beginning of her origin story. I wanted to create a memorial to life emerging. Into the eve of a picnic of trees of the strawberry rugulet rabbit Tyrone was the beginning of this new world written in Homeric dactyls full of resonances of the landscape of a one bedroom rental apartment in Queens over a loud Dominican bodega. Structurally, the project became a collage of an entirely different kind than some other kind of mission. In that first book, the collage elements had hard visible edges. There were bumps in the road. In a princess magic presto spell, those edges were blended together like a river flowing, winding across time and space. I gave it no particular direction. There was only revelation. It was like my child who was at the center of the work. No matter what plan I had, there was no plan. There was only a revelation of her life force and I followed it. Poems always function the same way for me. They are autonomous and otherworldly. In its autonomy, a princess magic presto spell became something both expected and unexpected. Into the eve of a picnic of trees of the strawberry rugulet rabbit Tyrone, into a glazed economic disturbance caused by the rain most dramatic and strange. The poem begins with that dactylic couplet and then breaks into bite-sized amounts of sleep-deprived dailiness. 
small whole moon in the sky, fish-like in semblance, as damp as an amphibract, the Anthony Braxton gland of ant launch, wind blown shutters, angry household gods, wet September horses. What I didn't anticipate were the other elements of Homeric epic that would emerge along the way. Tributes to those born into the culture of the poem, into my child's generation. Yuki Lily Atkins, Vivian Rose Champion, Adrian Walker Bruja Cook, a baby named Ellington, a midsummer kitten. Elegies to those poet prophets who died during that decade. Michael Gizzi, Tuli Kupferberg, Bruce Kurland, Ray De Palma, Anselm Hollow, Stephen Rodifer, Bill Kushner, Larry Fagan, Peter Cully, Jack Collum, Bobby Louise Hawkins, Bill Corbett, and Tom Gizzi. The naming of gods arrived. Figures not always of particular significance to me, but for some reason making their appearance known with proper three word epithets like gray eyed Athena. Shy Franz Schubert, lonely Frank O'Hara, poor Franz Kafka, sweet Paul Ceylon. The pathos of the gods, the absurdity of the news headlines, my child's first words, phrases misheard, all emerging together out of the push and pull between the world of the living and the world of the dead. It would be a mistake to let the Americana that I'm talking about sit on its romantic pedestal. At no point in bringing a child into the world could I turn away from the fearful lack of repentance that had doomed our culture. From my derby shuffle, which was adjacent to the Seneca nation, to Charles Olson's westward sprawl, to Robert Duncan's mysterious Golden Gate, to Frank O'Hara's dirty New York City, there's always something amiss. Those cattails waving in the marshy field, the snowy owl and the willow tree and the myriad stars in the sky and the jello and the Campbell's soup and the genocidal tendencies of a global super predator known as Homo sapiens. That push and pull, that tension, and that conversation between the eternal and the temporal, between the sacred and the profane, all of that is the spark for my poems. And all of those tensions press me into the form of a poet. Cattails interrupted by a red stop sign, interrupted by a car or many cars like the bees, like bees on the highway. The melancholy returns. Teeming with life, a midsummer kitten, Mars hangs low over guns, rape, and great white sharks. Teeming with life, the sumac trees lighting Flushing Bay. Teeming with life, rendered into death, the angel Moroni. Over the road, Harvey, Jack, and Bob, Robert, Jess, and Stan, the dog days, and then Rotifer. Teeming with life, a thing in a castle, in a Kafka story. Being in life, sound bites, iPhones, psyches. For emancipated, read emaciated in the Georgia pine woods. Last days of the standard enzyme company, teeming with life, these sober engines dreaming. The last, full, the last days of the rare full moon of Christmas Eve in Galesburg. For garage, read Carnage. The real sadness is knowing that this experiment is coming to an end. Not just the poem, the life's work, or the individual lives, but the grain elevators, the bridges, a manifest destiny cursed from the beginning with a greed that was called progress at the expense of all else. An extinction event, the sixth and largest. The prophetic in my poetry is the acknowledgement of that. The melancholy is the mixed sadness and joy that what we share in this moment is bearing witness to an unfolding drama, a new cosmic poem. 
that which has been absurd and unsustainable is also to be washed away. How does it feel to be a global super predator barreling across the country on Joe Biden's Amtrak? In my church community, the members of African descent refer to the people of, refer to people of European descent in this country as the 1619 virus. The reparations they wait for likely only come in the form of rising sea levels, which eliminate all of us super predators. Outside Waterloo, Indiana on the train, I hear the question James Joyce asked, when will the Finnegans wake? The cannon in the town square, idyllic like a jigsaw puzzle vista, is sinister to the cities on the hill on this continent. The melancholy is real, the beauty of this place and its fragility. That is how the process of making the poem is for me. Today, I would turn to Ted Berrigan's phrase, feminine, marvelous, and tough, and convert it to my own phrase, melancholic, beautiful, beautiful and fragile. To look at the beauty of decay and change and to intuit the sublime port of the poem where the dust becomes spirit and spirit becomes dust, where dust and spirit meet. The final section of a princess magic presto spell reveals that story. Dust and spirit in the cavernous eyes of our dead cat helped to immunitize the eschaton toward a fruit-based strangeness with the head of a girl with the snake of a body at the Erie County Fair. In the Synod of Dort, find a solitude near the chessmen and the tax returns where the llamas stream. In a luxury gay space, communism, find a dead woods post-colonial guerrilla exegesis. In the mobs of vindicators, find the root fallacy of the music that can carry it. And for a weird but true, read the world tree, read the crows of Boulder, read the magpies of London, read archaic tribal garbage or an original Christology, and then Jack, and then Bobby, and then Jeffrey's bridge, and then Corbett's ashes. In the funerals, dentists, divorces, in the brain masala and bima astrologers, be a brilliant heliotrope in a flannel waffle hemp. Read the welfare queen's strawberry unicorn cakes, her bare Buick rusting, no ding-dongs, no sea gods, and more Tom's outbounds.